You're listening to The Dirt on the Past, a show on history and archaeology and why it matters today. You can find us on the Extreme History Project website and also on kgbm.org. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Dirt on the Past from the Extreme History Project and KGBM Community Radio. Whether digging up a site or dusting off the archives, we bring you some of the most fascinating and cutting-edge research in history and archaeology and discuss why it matters today. Join me, Nancy Mahoney, alongside co-host Crystal Alegria, as we converse with anthropologists, archaeologists, and historians about how they bring the past alive. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we are co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week, we are at the Extreme History Headquarters speaking with Dr. Jack Fisher about his career as an archaeologist and professor at Montana State University. And we're excited to talk with Jack, but Crystal, before we dive into that, how was your week? What's new? It was a good week, and it was a fast week. It was Halloween week last Yay, week. Yay, that so, was fun. I liked yeah. your costume. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I went as a, a 1920s flapper. Mm. So uh, that That's was... always fun. Lots of sparkle. Yeah. Big eyelashes. I know. I get to, you know, you get to, you know, dress fancy, which they really dressed fancy in those days. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a little out of the ordinary for me. So that was really fun. But, um, but we did some great, we had some, we had a great cemetery tour on Halloween. We've never done a walking tour on Halloween before, but we decided to do it this year, and it was wonderful. It was great. We did a um, cemetery walking tour, and Jessica, our walking tour guide, um, did a little bit of a different cemetery tour that was focused more on legends and folklore of the cemetery. So it was cool. it was really good. Yeah, nice. it, was, it was a nice tour, and we filled it up. So um, so Jessica had a nice group of about thirty people on that tour. That sounds which was wonderful. wonderful. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And and your husband had a a big round birthday weekend. Huh? Yes, yes. So my husband just turned 50 and it's a big one. That's a big one. That's You're not 50 number. yet, are you? I will be shortly, but I am not 50 <laughs> yet. So I'm holding on to my Lucky 49. You. Yeah, <laughs> for yeah. A while. Oh, good for you. So yeah, so he had a big birthday weekend, which was really fun. Nice. Yeah, nice. It was great. So what about you, Nancy? How was your week? My week was also good. I feel like it went fast. Um, we have sort of gotten the shop all back together with our new countertops in and we are all loving it. It feels like it's all flowing smoothly and um, we got our new issue of Bozeman Life magazine just yesterday. Um, Brent dropped them off and your article is in there about the Bonton building, the building we're in. There's a picture of Babs um, from Alara and I in front of uh, our stores and they positioned us so they could photograph the building from the same angle of one of the historic photos yeah, that you provided. That. So that all looked really nice. And then they also did an article about Mocha Boutique and, and my staff was in there. So that was really nice to see. That yeah. was fun to have. And you wrote that article, didn't you? I Nancy? did. I wrote yeah, the article and it was um, a relief to read it and not find any typos. So I was really happy <laughs> that between me and the editors yeah. it all came out well, right? Oh, that's great. I can't read them. I'm so, you, it's good that you read it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm just not going to read it now. <laughs> <laughs> you mean your article? You're my not going to read. Yeah, yeah, my article. But I not, think your article is, read is perfect okay. as well. No issues yours. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then tomorrow, I'm headed off to London, um, yeah, visiting my sister, who's also having a big birthday yeah. on the sixth of November. And so I am going to uh, be heading off with my daughter. We'll have a week there. We're going to go to Oxford, which I'm oh, so fun. excited about, and then do a lot of sightseeing. So I will be enjoying a lot of history um, while I'm gone over Good. there. Good. So that'll be super fun. Um, so I guess enough about us. Do you want to quickly thank one of our sponsors before we yes. get back to our guest? Um, we're excited to have our sponsor for the episode, the Western Heritage Center. So we'll talk a little bit more about them in a bit. All right. So welcome, Jack. We're so glad to have you here. Thanks for inviting me, Crystal and Nancy. It's 
great to be here. I know. It's great, even though I used to see you almost every day or at least <laughs> three times a week uh, when we were at MSU. It feels like it's been a while. Um, so we're going to start off by uh, telling our listeners a little bit about you. Jack. So Dr. Jack Fisher taught anthropology at Montana State University in Bozeman for 30 years, and he now serves as an emeritus associate professor. During his career, his archaeological research focused on the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains of Montana. He also did archaeological research in the Western Cape of South Africa in collaboration with archaeologists at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, which I'm always so excited to hear about because, of course, my husband being from South Africa and visit there, and Jack, we have yet to be there at the same time and cross paths. We'll have to work on that. Someday, yes. Now maybe our schedules are a little more flexible. At the beginning of Dr. Fisher's career, he did ethno-archaeological research for one year when he lived among the F.A. people, part-time hunter-gatherers in, and you're going to have to tell me the name of that forest. The Aturi Forest. The Aturi Forest, just like it looks like it's spelled, but I was afraid to say it. Okay, in the Aturi Forest, that's in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So welcome, Jack. We're so excited to have you today. Welcome, Jack. We always start off our podcast by asking our guests how they got interested and involved in their profession. And so I just wanted to start off by asking you, and I don't know if I've ever asked this, you this question, how did you get interested in archaeology and how did you uh, go along the path to become an anthropologist? I uh, became interested in archaeology when I was in junior high school and high school. My family lived in South America, in the country of Bolivia, uh, during those years. And we lived in La Paz, the city in the high Yeah, the high very high altitude. Wow. Of, of uh, Bolivia. And there were archaeological sites from the Inca culture all around and pre-Inca civilizations, archaeological remains. So I saw lots of those during those years and became interested in archaeology, and I never looked back. Yeah, yeah. So you knew you were going to go to school for that. That was a done deal right. early yes. on. You were fascinated with those, and you wanted to learn more. But that's not the um, culture that you ended up studying, is it? No, no, yeah. it's not. Uh, I, I was quite interested and still continue to be interested in uh, South American and Central American yeah. Yeah, Past fascinating cultures. civilizations, especially in South America. I feel like they kind of break a lot of the traditional models um, that archaeologists originally had about how civilizations developed that came more from sort of Western ideas. Mm -hmm. So, I yeah, that must have been fascinating. Um, we want to start off, though, before that, asking you a little bit about the ethno-archaeological work that you did. And am I right that this was for your dissertation? That's correct. That was my doctoral dissertation research. And uh, this opportunity to carry out ethnoarchaeological research among the FA uh, came about when I was in graduate school. And as we just mentioned, turned out to me, be my doctoral dissertation topic. Uh, my research was part of a long-term research project started by other anthropologists, carried out among the FA and also among the Lesse who are farmers who live side by side with the FA. And that project had started four years before I became involved and continued for a number of years afterwards. And the reason I got involved was because of my archaeological experiences here in Montana, you know, investigating you know, pre-contact era Native American sites, and you know, among them, sites that we thought archaeologically were habitation sites, residential campsites, and we would find fireplaces and clusters of artifacts or of animal bones and so forth, but we kind of puzzled, you know, how do we, you know, can we try and, you know, make sense of what we're finding archaeologically and try and get some sense in you know, how do we interpret these materials and get some sense of, you know, what is it that we're looking at? Is this a residential campsite or... Short Relating term. it to the ways of life, the subsistence behaviors, how they made a living. So you're saying that right. you were probably studying mobile hunter-gatherer communities Correct. here in Montana as an archaeologist. And so your work with the FA was so that you could live among people who were still living as hunter-gatherers. That exactly. was their subsistence way of life. Even mm -hmm. though it's a very different environment in the forest, you could still see how is it that they move around? What do they leave behind? That kind of thing. That's right. So uh, the FA are you know, part-time hunter-gatherers. They have this 
you know, symbiotic relationship with the lessee, so they do have cultivated, eat mm-hmm. cultivated foods and so forth, but they do live a you know, mobile, you know, nomadic hunting and gathering way of life. And by watching them on their day-to-day activities, you know, what is the spatial organization of their residential campsites? Where are dwellings located? Where are fireplaces located in relation to dwellings? Where do people carry out the day-to-day activities that they do when they're at these campsites? And where do the material remains of these activities end up? That ultimately will be come the archaeological record, right? And the, yeah, that is, yeah. and the archaeological record that uh, we excavate back here so in Montana. Did so. they think you were strange, documenting <laughs> all their trash? I mean, I have so many questions. But the fir- first of all, this is part of a bigger project. There, there were maybe other anthropologists that went in years before you mm-hmm. who were who were studying other things about their language Correct. or culture. Okay, right. and then you come along. And like you're the trash guy, you're no. you're like. But did did you already know the language? Let's start there. No, didn't did not know the language, and I, I did not learn their primary language, which was a pretty tough one to mm. learn. Mm-hmm. Um, so I learned Swahili, mm. and which is a lingua franca okay. in that part of, of Africa. Sure. And communicated with the. F A N Lesse in Swahili. Okay. Oh, that's which is a second language for them or a third language. There there are a number of different languages in a relatively small area there. And most people speak, you know, multiple languages, including Swahili. Um, okay. So okay. that they can communicate with. Are you gonna jump in with yeah, a question? Because yeah, I got I'm like ten more. Go, 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 go. <laughs> you. So, so Jack, uh, what did you do on a daily basis? Um, while you were living with the FA, what was your job while you were there? What would you do, like, when you got up every day? Well, what, the like, daily, what did you do? Um, got up in the morning, and, you know, we lived in houses that were constructed in the same fashion as the lesse, the, okay. the, the farmer farmers, villagers' farmers. houses, okay. which were what's called waddle and daub construction, so wooden posts set vertically and then interwoven horizontally with branches and vines and so forth, and then plastered with mud, and then they had a leaf roof so they were waterproof and the previous re- the researchers who got this whole project started built this little research station okay. so that you know, whenever new anthropologists like me came out there they had a place to live and so forth yeah. um and being very close to the equator just one or two degrees you know, north of the equator uh the sun rose at six o'clock in the morning and set at six o'clock at night, pretty much. Oh, wow! Because you're right year. in the equator, yeah. yeah. And um, the first thing we did when we got up was prepare breakfast, and we cooked over an open fire, just like um, were, the local were, people, the F and the Lesse, because we didn't have any. There was no electricity out there. There was no plumbing. You know, we got our water from a spring and cooked over an open wood fire, no refrigerator or anything like that. Did you eat um, all the same food that local people were eating? To some extent. Some we, we also had, we could get canned foods okay. and foods that the local people didn't eat, but we ate a lot of the same kinds of foods that they did. And were the were the lesse, um were they slash and burn farmers? Were they in the forest? Correct. Were they at the edge of the forest? This is all, this was in the okay. tropical rainforest within it. Um, and they were carried out yeah, it's just slash and burn farming, which is you know, cutting down the trees when they're creating a garden that they're going to plant. You know, several months before cutting down the smaller trees. Some of the trees are huge, and but smaller trees and brush and so forth, letting it dry out, mm-hmm. and then burning it in the ashes. Yeah, you know, add a little bit of nutrients to the soil, mm-hmm. and then they plant their gardens. So yeah. maybe so they use those gardens slash and burn for like three years or two something, or three years and or then so they have to move. Okay, one, and then hopefully the forest regenerates. But um, mm-hmm. so w- so back to the day. So yeah, the day, yeah. What so happens the breakfast. Next? You would know, start off the day making breakfast and so forth, and then uh, we sort of get organized for doing our research. And oftentimes that was visiting an occupied FA camp, okay. and so we would get together our notebooks and. Yeah, some food and so forth. And you, this, this would be a, a out and back in a single day. Sometimes when the FA camp was further out in the forest, yeah, on a few, some occasions we did spend several nights out in the forest quite a ways away, but typically it was out and back in the same day. Okay. And so we would go to an FA camp you know, by prearrangement and you know, spend time 
you know, observing the, the daily activities. Usually we were you know, pretty inaus inauspicious in the, in the camps, observing the activities that the people did, taking notes on what they did, you know, like cooking their own meals, you know, socializing, making or repairing tools and implements and so forth. Are you whipping yeah. out your tape measure to see how far the hearth is <laughs> away did. from, we, you we, know? We did that, <laughs> yes. We, we mapped about 30 FA camps, okay. most of them after the camp had been abandoned. Okay. But some of that's them, we awkward. mapped them when they yeah. were still being occupied. <laughs> right. yeah, but that's less awkward after it right. was abandoned. But yeah. that's a big part of what we did because we were interested in the spatial layout of these right. camps yeah. was, you know, get out our tape measures and measure mm -hmm. the distance between each camp and the distance from each dwelling, from the doorway of each dwelling to the external fireplace around which people sat and cooked okay. their meals and so forth. Did you get to also understand family relationships and organizations and if that played out into mm -hmm. how huts were laid out? I just think of the Richard Lee ethnography right. of, of the, the Kung Lasan people. We did. Well, yeah. We see some of that. And it played out in the spatial organization of the camps. A typical FA camp we discovered were all of the FA, after mapping all of these camps and visiting additional ones that we didn't map, we discovered that the spatial organization, the spatial layout is all, they all follow the same general pattern. Every mm -hmm. single camp is unique in the details of mm -hmm. how many dwellings there are and how far apart they are from one another, but they all follow the, the same general pattern, which is that the they create a clearing, usually oval or circular, but sometimes a different shape, and the dwellings are situated on the edge of the clearing. And in the tropical rainforest, the vegetation is pretty dense, so it's almost like a physical wall on the edge of the clearing. And so the dwellings are along the edge of the clearing. Each dwelling, almost all dwellings, have at least one fireplace inside them for warmth at night. And if it's a rainy day to escape the rain, some of them, especially larger dwellings, sometimes had two mm -hmm. fireplaces in and, and as, I, as I said, for warmth at night, uh, even in the mm -hmm. tropical rainforest, it you know, cooled off sure, at night time. Sure. And, um, and then there was almost every dwelling had a fireplace outside of the doorway. Um, and that's where many activities took place, we discovered. So that was a combination of which in our my house, I've got a living room, which is separate from you know, the dining room. And then there's a work room yeah, and right. so forth. All of those different activities occurred right around these fires. People socialized, they cooked their food. If the if a fellow was carving an arrow, because mm -hmm. the, the men just hunted with bows and arrows, you know, they would do that around sitting around the fire. So these were multi activity areas, which archaeological is very important. Right. And and then the trash, they every camp had trash heaps and the location of that was very redundant from one camp to another. The trash heaps were right behind and on the sides of each dwelling. So each family tended to toss their trash behind and beside the dwelling they occupied. And then if it was a particularly large camp and if it had a big tree, say, in the middle of the camp, mm -hmm. sometimes those acted as a magnet where some trash was deposited as well. Mm -hmm. So that's the general layout. But social factors did come into play. For example, we discovered you got to know the people individually and uh, kinship relations between folks and close relatives almost always had their dwellings next to one another. So you might have an elderly man and a woman, husband and wife, and the, if they have one of their adult children's and, uh, mm -hmm. and the son has grown up and he's married, and they're with, married with their sure. huts almost always would be right next to one another. Yeah. Or two adult brothers and their families, if they're in the same camp, they're dwellings would almost always be right. close to one another. Mm -hmm. And interpersonal relationships, people that were getting along well, you know, that sure. could, you know, my dwellings would be might be close together if there are certain people who are not getting along so well, <laughs> yeah, then those hooks are far apart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's so yeah. sort of an archetype almost diagram then that's, as you said, it wouldn't capture all the specifics, but you could sort of say this is a general layout of what we right. have. And would that be something that would be useful to even translate to then mobile foraging societies in Montana and other places? In, in one, in certain respect. So from an archaeological standpoint, if we thought about that pattern I just described for FA camps, you know, what would that look like archaeologically right. if we got good preservation uh, you know, of, of 
perishable materials like baskets that were discarded on a trash heap and the, the vegetable remains when they peeled a vegetable and threw the peels on the trash heap and charcoal from the fires that they used every day. If all that, all that yeah. stuff gets on the, thrown on the trash heap and then you have the fireplace. And, mm -hmm. and if we just pretended all that stuff preserved, we would see a, a broad pattern, and that is there would be this outer circle of fires that represents the fireplace that's inside each dwelling. Then there'd be an inner circle of fires, and that represents the fireplaces that were associated with each dwelling where people sat around and cooked and socialized and made things and so forth. And then close to that outer ring of fires, you would pick up the charcoal and discarded baskets and plant and foods and all that sort of thing. So there actually be so, a separation of what kinds of materials and then what kinds of behaviors that they would reflect? Well, the, the, tra the trash heaps among the FA were generalized, mm -hmm. so you didn't get, you know, one trash heap was just you know, okay. discarded baskets and another trash heap was just charcoal. Each trash heap had all, all, of, all, all of that stuff, you know, gotcha. which is important because probably in some uh, ancient forager societies in other parts of the world, you might get specialized trash heaps, but mm -hmm. not among the FA. So that's the sort of template if we were excavating a site and excavated the entire site and saw this pattern of one, an outer circle of fireplaces and then an inner circle of fireplaces. And wow, there's all sorts of discarded material near that outer Right. Fireplaces, we might be able to say, hmm, those might represent dwellings and so forth. Yeah. So getting back to your question, well, should we expect that pattern here in Montana with ancient Native American sites? I Probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't expect that the patterning is going to be the same, but I do expect, you know, based on my experience among the effort, that there is going to be patterning in archaeological sites here, back here in the Great Plains or Rocky Mountains. There will be strong patterning. It's probably going to be different from the pattern, the spatial organization of the residential campsites from that of the FA. But I would expect that there's going to be redundancy and patterning that eventually we should be able to, to figure out. Mm -hmm. And fireplaces and trash heaps, I think, trying to locate those as archaeologists when we're investigating pre-contact era campsites here in Montana, mm -hmm. I would start, I would hope to find fireplaces and the remains right. of trash heaps. To, I to just home always in. think of that sort of circular formation in terms of facing in in mm -hmm. a circular. Oh, that seems right. to be something that translates almost everywhere. Right. You have a hunter-gatherer yeah. camp. Um, and then I was, I was thinking also that um, where they would sort of do their toilet activity. Would mm. that be a, an outer ring outside of the clearing? Would yeah, that, that, be that would be clearing? outside, and yeah, we didn't really look into that. Okay. So I don't okay. know how close or far outside of there. But, okay. but that would be outside of the clearing, outside of the campsite area. Outside that would of be that off in the forest area. somewhere. Yeah. And outside of the, you know, well, outside the trash area. Okay. Yeah. So when you came back to Montana then, did you try to look at – campsites here in Montana to see if there was any similarities? Have you done that recently? I haven't had the opportunity really to try and apply that to okay. um, Montana campsites. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, uh, that would be interesting. It would be, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. you've been doing do. a lot of other things here in Montana, yeah, yeah. a lot of other, other research. Did you yeah. want to ask any more questions the before The only we move thing on? I want to ask before you okay. move on is um, I'm, I'm assuming there were no, among the FA when you were there, no like domesticated dogs or anything else that maybe Oh, there were with very them? much, yeah. Okay, because mm -hmm. I was wondering how that might affect some of the patterning or help mm -hmm. create some of the patterning because we sure. often mm -hmm. do look at hunter-gatherer camps and, and think about mm -hmm. – those early domestication of dogs and then how that plays into some of the formation processes or gnawing we'd see on the bones right. or whatever, right. you know. So they did have They did men. have dogs, okay. dogs, and they were important, among other things, for the hunting. The, the men sure. hunted various species of antelope using their bows and arrows, and they usually hunted them in groups. A group of men would go out, and, and they used the dogs to help to flush the, sure. the antelope and so forth. So they're important in that respect. And then the dogs, as you said, did hang out around in the camps and any animal bones that were discarded, food remained, the, the, the people discarded. They oftentimes the dogs would get those and either chew them and yeah. discard them or consume them entirely. So, so we didn't see too many bones, discarded bones at archaeological sites. And I think that's in part because of animal bones from food remains, sure. because the dogs were 
Do people feel of, think of them as as pets? Like my dog likes to sleep with me. I mean, do they sleep <laughs> with their dog? That's a big question. I don't know if they yeah. Yeah, slept right so in, interesting. In, the, in the dwellings with them or not. Right. I guess it depends on how mangy the dog is. Right. 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 Exactly. right. You know. Yeah. You know. And so, Jack, um, you said you when you were talking about your work with the FA, you talked about we would go and can you mm-hmm. can you talk oh, about who we yes. is? We was uh, me and my wife, yeah. the two of us. What an adventure together. to have together. Yeah, 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 it was quite an adventure. And then and was your son Philip with you at all that, no, during that time? No, this was before. Okay, so before Philip. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. oh, wonderful. Yeah, well, Crystal I knows my wife who passed yes. away, unfortunately, yeah. a number of years ago from cancer and, and our son Philip. So, yeah. so I, Helen was there and very much... You know, an integral part of all of this research. Yeah, Fantastic. I just wanted to bring Helen's name into this because yeah. I, I think she was, and and she was such a wonderful woman, and I knew Helen, so it was. Um, I, I just wanted you to say her name. <laughs> well, I appreciate in, that. In that in that part, <laughs> we, we'll talk. Thank maybe you talk, for doing that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we'll talk about her a little bit in a few minutes here as well, because, um, like I said, you've spent a lot of time doing research here in Montana, mm-hmm. and one of the things that you've done, along with um, Dr. Tom Roll is spent many years excavating at First People's Buffalo Jump site, which is located near Great Falls, Montana, which is kind of in central, would you say central Central Montana? Montana. Central Mm -hmm. Central Montana. And First People's Buffalo Jump site is one of the largest buffalo jumps in the state, possibly um, even in the nation. Possibly. It depends on, there are various ways you can measure how big a Buffalo Jump site is. One is by the length of the cliff, and by that measure, yeah, First People's Buffalo Jump certainly is, you know, one of the very biggest because the, the cliff is very long. Yeah. And it was used more heavily for bison jumping in some locations, and either not at all or much less frequently in, in other locations. Mm-hmm. And also the depth of the deposits is another way how many right. bison were killed. That's another way of measuring them. So, so it's difficult. Yeah. I, I okay. hesitate to say it's the biggest. I, know. I, 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 sure. I hesitated to say that, too. But it's a very but, but large, it's a large one. It, it's, yeah. it was used. It's an um, impressive site. It's an impressive site. Absolutely. And so um, this site, First People's Buffalo Jump, is currently a state park and actually a national historic landmark as well. And um, indigenous people used this site for at least a thousand years before Lewis and Clark came through what we now call Montana. And like Jack, you said, it's a mile long sandstone cliff and there are remnants of many drive lines along the top of the cliff. And there are up to 18 feet of compacted buffalo remains below the, the cliff. So 18 feet, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about your work at First People's Buffalo Jump and some of the main takeaways from your research. But I also want to say that um, this is where, at First People's Buffalo Jump, is where I got to know you, Jack, because <laughs> I was working, I was an, an undergraduate student at Montana State University where you were teaching, and uh First People's Buffalo Jump, which we then called Om Pishkin. It had a different name at that time. It was called Om Pishkin. And that's where I did my field school for my, my archaeology. And I think I did that for about three summers out there, which was um, so significant and so important to me. And that's where I learned all my archaeological knowledge is at Om Pishkin, or First People's Buffalo Jump. And so that was, and so you were a new professor at Montana State University. You started <laughs> right. teaching there in 1990. Right. And, and that's when I started at Montana State University. University and I went into MSU knowing I wanted to be an archaeologist, and so the first archaeology class I took was with you, and it was your first archaeology class that you were teaching. It was Anthropology oh, wow. 101. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. So that was fun. So yeah, yeah. I, so it was all great. They it was three years of field work, and actually, there's three generations of, of uh, archaeology there because Tom Roll, as you said, was co-director. Yeah. He was a professor at Montana State University at that time, and he was co-directing with me the, our investigations at Olm Pishkin and now First People's Buffalo Jump. And I actually was an undergraduate student in anthropology at Montana State University back <laughs> in the mid and late 70s, and Tom Roll was a fairly new professor there then, and I was a student at the archaeological field school he taught oh at another gosh. bison kill site, the Bootlegger Trail bison kill site in right. northern Montana. 
So, so generations. <laughs> generations. Generations, yeah. right. And, you know, and now we work, and Nancy, you know, is working and teaching students, um, again, that now are working with us at Extreme History. And so right. it's just these generations of students kind of coming through. Yeah, it's but, been really fantastic. But, yeah. yeah. So anyway, tell us a little bit about First People's Buffalo Jump and your okay. research there. Our research was fairly exploratory. Um, and from the standpoint, fairly limited in an extent from the standpoint of how, given how large the site is and how extensive both horizontally along the base of the cliff and the depth, the vertical depth, how extensive it is. Our excavations were you know, pretty limited. And we were just trying to find out some basic archaeological information about the site. So some of the things we found are include that um, it was used all of the layers we excavated, all of the t deposits we excavated of bison bones and arrow points and other artifacts and so forth, you know, come from what archaeologists regionally call the late pre-contact period, which began about 1,800 years ago and is demarcated by archaeologists by the introduction of the bow and arrow technology in roughly 1,800 years ago in, in this part of the Great Plains. And all of the projectile points, which is generic for both arrow points and spear points, all of the projectile points we found in our excavation are, were arrow points, you know, indicating to us that the bison killing procurement was taking that was taking place was from the late pre-contact period. So that site wasn't used. You're saying just to help our listeners understand. Adaladles, uh, spear throwers would have been used before that. The points are Correct. a bit different. Often they can be bigger and thicker and, and things like that. But but those projectile points. But you're saying everything you found indicated that this was once the bow and arrow had been adopted, at least in this part of the northern plains. And Correct. Although our, and the radiocarbon dates that we got from mm -hmm. As various well, radiocarbon so. dates reinforce that. They all fall within that well, time Well, that span. helps determine actually when the bow and arrow was right, right yeah. adopted for sure yeah. because it, it varies a bit even across the mm -hmm. state. Right. Yeah. But on the other hand, we we don't know that we, we that our excavations went uh, down to the mm -hmm. bottom of the deposits. It's mm -hmm. conceivable that at least in some parts of the site there might be deeper older. deposits okay. yet that, that could be older. All right, right. 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 Yeah. That was such an amazing um, archaeological site. And if any, if you have a chance to go out there, they have a wonderful uh, visitor center at the state park. And they talk a lot about the buffalo jump and they, they even have a little section about the archaeology that's been done there over the years. So right. and then also, um, Jack, you have a chapter in a book called Interpreting, Interpreting First People's Bison Kills at Heritage Parks, um, Pishkin. Well, the name of the book is Pishkin, right? Or yeah, Pishkin, Pishkin, colon, okay. Interpreting. Interpreting First yeah. People's Bison Kills at Heritage Parks. And so you have a chapter in this Tom book. Tom Roland, I, correct. Tom, Tom Roland, you I, have a, a chapter in this book that talks specifically about First, First People's, People's that's correct. Buffalo Jump. Mm -hmm. But there's other chapters by other um, authors that discuss other bison jump sites throughout the nation as well, or kind of throughout the West. So it's right. a great book. Yeah, it's a yeah. good yeah. book, and it's the... The main thrust of the book, the goal of the book, is the public interpretation, the interpretation for the public of bison kill sites in different parts of the American West. Yeah, yeah. So it's all great. of the chapters deal in one way or another with the with public interpreta yeah. interpreting. Yeah. Do you have sites. any main takeaways from your research at the site or your time working on the material from the site? Well, yeah, one is that some of the patterns we found um, going back to the bootlegger trail bison kill site, for example, when I was a field school student. Um, <laughs> Way back. Which, which is yeah, exactly, <laughs> practically radiocarbon dating. I'm older uh, than Crystal, so I can't um, really say anything. <laughs> that was also a late pre-contact period bison kill site, and we found some spatial patterning there, interestingly, oh. which kind of following up on the spatial patterning of the effort of spatial patterning at uh, at the bison kill sites at Bootlegger Trail, we found the pattern, and the same pattern held true at Long Pishkin, of there was a kill area where the bison were killed, and then there was a separate area, in the case of Bootlegger Trail, about 70 meters away, that we interpret as a processing area where carcass, bison carcass parts were taken and 
further butchered, meat removed from the carcass parts. Limb bones were broken open to extract the marrow, which is very nutritious. And probably bones were broken up further and boiled in uh, probably hide-lined pits to extract the grease from the bones, which also is, is nutritious. And it turns out, as I learned, as um, I became more involved with you know, the you know, bison kill sites, including Old Pishkin, that this pattern is pretty common in late pre-contact period bison kill sites, getting a kill area and commonly finding this processing area and possibly even, I, I think in some cases, they might be a habitation area as well. Right, almost like a camp lo located around nearby the a campsite Because okay. you know, we found some domestic artifacts at First People's Buffalo Jump. You know, so we found some all, all perforating tools made out of bone, animal bone, that probably would have been used for hide working okay. and, and things like that that suggest domestic activities were taking place. And these were not right at the base of the cliff. And at the base of the cliff, what we found, what the artifacts we found were limited to arrow points and cutting tools. Cutting tools. A lot but of carnage way, at the base of the cliff. Probably, I mean, is that yeah. what you what yeah. you see when you look at these deposits of bone? Just to help people understand, so they're removing not the entire carcass of every bison. They're removing parts Correct. that they yeah. wanted and leaving behind. So, for example, what would be more? Uh, commonly left behind at the kill site. Ver vertebral columns, mm -hmm. for example, probably that you might, would cut the would strip the, the meat free from the vertebral column and then mm -hmm. leave that. So, like what behind. hunters might do today if they had to process in the field for bringing it out rather yeah. than just dumping it off right, at a place right. where someone will do it for them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I remember a lot of horn cores. Horn cores, too. right? Yeah. 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 A lot right. of skulls. Skull, and skull, skulls, skulls, and skulls and so forth. And stuff. Yeah. Jaws. Yeah. Correct. The bone preservation was poorer right oh, at the base of the cliff than yeah. it was on this bench, what we call the bench immediately adjacent to the cliff. And that's where 20, the bench was anywhere from 20 to 50 meters wide before it dropped off to a steep slope. But on that bench away from the cliff is where we found what we think is a processing area and these domestic artifacts and so forth. And the bone pre preservation was better there. And I think part of the reason the bone preservation wasn't so good at the base of the cliff was because of the sandstone cliff and blocks continued to break off and build up. So when the bones that were left there, they probably didn't get buried as quickly. There was, they were more vulnerable to deterioration okay. over time. We're going to take a quick station break and then continue with a few more questions. You are listening to The Dirt on the Pass with co-hosts Crystal Alegria and Nancy Mahoney on KGVM Bozeman or wherever you find your podcasts. We're speaking today with Dr. Jack Fisher about his career as an archaeologist, mostly here in Montana, but also in South Africa, other places. So um, before we um, move on, a few more questions just about First People's um, Jump site, Buffalo Jump, do we call it? It's, mm -hmm. Is it called Om Pushkin anymore? It's or not. Pushkin? No, okay. it's called First People's Buffalo Jump. Okay. And so, um, and they do Correct. call it Buffalo Jump instead of Bison, which... Correct. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, the official, official state name. park name, name is yeah. okay. First People's okay. Buffalo Jump State Park. Yeah. So, so Jack, you did your doctoral research among the FA, but it um, as, as long as I've known you, your specialty has been um, dealing with the faunal remains, animal bones. Correct. And mm -hmm. you, you've taught about that to all these students who rave about their experiences. I've, I've seen you with, with collections. I've seen you out at sites. And um, so did you um, specialize while you were working on your dissertation? I think you were at Berkeley. Or did, you, did that come later? Or tell us a little bit about how that became the focus of a lot of your expertise. I became interested in analyzing animal bones from archaeological sites. Actually, back when I was an undergraduate, mm. I uh, had the opportunity then to, uh, as an undergraduate student, to analyze bones from an archaeological site here in Montana called the Lost Terrace Site. So oh. I didn't know a uh, humorous from a femur <laughs> when I started out. So um, some graduate students from other universities who were passing through, you know, very kindly helped me get started in learning how to identify bones and how to interpret them. And at that same time, I participated in the field school at the Bootlegger Trail you know, Bison Kill site where we were finding lots of bison bones. And I didn't analyze those 
um, right. for the final report. But I obviously learned a lot yeah. because of my interest. It had already been stimulated in, in Boone's. I learned a lot about Boone's from um, participating in the excavations at the Bootlegger Trail Bison Kill site. And then I sort of stayed involved with analyzing animal Boone's you know, from sites here in Montana and South Africa subsequently. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I've seen you with bison jaws, and you're very interested in, in, you know, the tooth eruption patterns if we have a juvenile. So the the site that I was at with Mike Neely, you come out, and we're really interested in finding the jaw bones of juveniles. So just tell people a little bit about what you can tell from looking at um, tooth eruption or just carefully looking at the teeth and the eruption patterns in in bison. The thing, one of the questions I am particularly interested in in looking at the stage of tooth eruption of juvenile bison where not all of the permanent teeth are yet fully erupted. Um, Some of the permanent teeth in some cases haven't erupted yet at all or they're only partially erupted is to try and get an estimate of what season of the year the bison died at a given bison kill site and so that we can we can use that information to, as, a, as a proxy for hunting. saying that's when the season of the year that the hunting was yeah. taken taken place. Okay. And in a an environment like Montana that's temperate with mm-hmm. seasonal extremes, you know, hot, dry summers and cold winters, it's very helpful for archaeologists in our attempts to try and you know, learn about how ancient peoples had adapted to the environment mm-hmm. to know what season of the year bison killing was taking place and other sorts of activities at other sites. So that's one of the... Yeah, Yeah. especially at sites like that where it it required a lot of people and a fair amount of organization. It didn't just happen impromptu. You're walking along and, oh, let's run some bison. I mean, you're following the bison, but just to understand a lot more about the life way, it it seems to me that seasonality becomes a critical piece of understanding a larger part of of that picture. So were you able, Jack, to... Figure out when the um, bison were being killed at um, First Peoples. We were at, at First yeah. Peoples. We found another a number of jaws of juvenile bison, and analyzed the stage of tooth eruption. And those generally fall in the f- indicate death in the fall of the year. Okay. So bison procurement was in the fall of the year. We also found bones of unborn bison, fetal bison. And those can also be an indicator of roughly of the season of death okay. because you know, the bison are born somewhere around, typically around the, the the peak of bison birthing is late April, early May, and right. so forth. so you have sort and of a late spring or early summer birth. Right, so okay. you can work your way back. Mm-hmm. And so okay. the, the fetal bison indicate... You know, hunting death of the fetal fetuses sometime in the winter time oh, or, okay. or early or spring winter early mm, spring. Mm. So they were so they were killing them in fall, but then possibly Apparently again in the also, spring. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. And you know that just leads you down to being able to start think about other really interesting questions about how much they're able to preserve from those fall hunts, and then what's going on in the spring, and mm-hmm. if the bison themselves might be not at their full fattest you know, mm-hmm. potential towards the end of the winter, right. but and then where they might be on the landscape doing that. So that's pretty fascinating. Um, I also just think it's fascinating to think about uh, some of these jumps where you have both atlatl um, points and then also bow and arrow points. And so some sites in different layers, you you see that people are coming back but over centuries, maybe later, and using different technology, but still equally successfully, it seems right. like. Yeah, in yeah. some places, it seems they're a little slower to adopt the bow and arrow. Um, mm-hmm. I just find there's a, a, a fascinating array of questions you can ask and answer. And of course, I am late to studying the Northern Plains archaeology <laughs> in my career, but I'm finding it incredibly fascinating. So, so from the First Peoples excavations, um, a, a ton of faunal remains, I imagine, and artifacts that probably were unearthed, even though the excavations themselves were not hugely extensive. If they're, if they're 
densely filled. I mean, just the small test pits Mike and I did um, in the Garneal area, an amazing amount of bone can come out of a one by one meter unit. Um, so where are those artifacts now? And, um, and are they in a place where further research is being done on them now? Or just tell us a little bit about you know, what's happened to those artifacts since those field schools you all participated in? All of the artifacts and the, and the bison bones that we had here for a long time at Montana State University now are um, in the city of Billings, Montana, at what's a facility called the Billings Curation Center. And that's a curation center um, managed by the Bureau of Land Management, a federal agency. And it's an excellent place, an outstanding facility for the permanent curation of archaeological collections like First Peoples. And so all of those materials are there now and available for researchers and other interested people to look at uh, in the future. And so even though this isn't BLM land necessarily that it was on because it's um, a federal facility and this is a state state, state park, park. Or George, they have some agreement then that, that yeah, an that's agreement. where they can be curated. An agreement was made between mm-hmm. Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and yeah. the BLM. And they have a nice yeah. facility there and the mm-hmm. esteemed David Wade looking over all of the <laughs> materials there. That's good. And, that, and that, that's a very important question because um, there will always, you know, Archaeologists will come mm-hmm. up with new questions mm-hmm. to ask to that they can try and answer by analyzing the artifacts from the First Peoples Buffalo Jump or by analyzing the animal bones. New technologies will be developed mm-hmm. to high-tech sorts of things to analyze stone artifacts, animal bones, and so forth. So it's, um, it's great to have collections like First Peoples. Right. Yeah. Available. Collection yeah. curated and available for researchers and other interesting yeah. people to I mean, look even at when reports decades are written, in the future. It's, you, you do the best you can to present a full report after a project, but you can't answer every conceivable Correct. question. And then, right. as you said, new technologies. Mm-hmm. So it is wonderful, and I just I think it's so nice to encourage students who have an interest to learn about all those existing collections. Yeah, and, and you yeah. know, that's those collections are available for students to work on for years and years in the future to do their master's um, projects or PhD projects on. So, and of course, you hope probably that some students do that, that right. they go in and, and look at those collections because they have so much more information to give. And it's it's important, you know, when you think of doing archaeology, you're thinking about taking all these artifacts and and faunal remains out of the ground, but they have to be stored somewhere forever if you take them out of the ground. So, so it's, it's a nice, huge responsibility. It's a huge responsibility, um, and so there. So it's a responsibility, but it's also an opportunity for people to continue to learn from those artifacts. So, uh, so it's nice that we have a great facility where they can be housed. So, Jack, more recently. In the last few years, you've been working with another really significant site here in Montana, and it's called the the Second Crow Indian Agency Historical Site. And this is not a um, pre-contact site like we were just talking about with First Peoples, but more of a historical site, so more a more recent archaeological site. And this one is um, very important as well, and um, I've been involved in this one a little bit too. So I just and you've done a lot of the faunal analysis of the animal bones that came out of this archaeological site. So could you just tell us a little bit about first, first what this site is, um, what this place uh, was, and then the work that you've done, the research you've done at this place? Sure. So this is the. Called the Second Crow Indian Agency, as you said, sometimes also known as Absorka Agency. And it was used as an Indian agency cre- created by the federal government and used by the federal government as an Indian agency you know, from 1875 to 1884 um, with the people from the Crow tribe, the Crow Nation. And it's located sort of in south central Montana, about three miles or so south of the small town of Absorkey. Um, and it's the second of three Crow Indian agencies that have been created. The first of the three was Fort Parker and near the town of Livingston, about 30 miles from where we are here in Bozeman, 30 miles to the east. 
And then the second Crow Agency was created and used from 1875 to 1884. And then the third Crow Agency is created where it's located now at Crow Agency on the, the Crow Indian Reservation. And the time period that um, the second Crow Indian Agency was used as an Indian agency was you know, a very important transitional period in the life ways of the, the Crow people, the Crow nation. And so for them it was and still is, I believe, a, a very important site. Uh, and um, and for Montana and for the, the U.S., it's an important site because of the, the history of what it represents in uh, in the westward expansion expansion of Euro Americans and kind of that reservation uh, time period. Correct, the yeah. reservation, the beginning of the reservation time period. Right, right. Archaeological work was carried out in 2006 and in 2011 at the Second Crow Indian Agency because some highway construction work was going to take place along a, a highway that runs you know, north-south through there, and the highway goes right through, turns out right through the Crow Indian Agency. And so archaeological work was done to try and mitigate you know, some of the destructive effects that this highway construction might have and you know, what can we learn. And, and fortunately, the, I think there's, the construction didn't have hugely destructive effects because of the archaeological work that was yeah, done. Yeah, because we, we they learned so much. went in and found out that there was a lot of aspects of that Indian agency that were still very intact. And so they, the Montana Department of Transportation actually ended up not doing the work that they, the, the road work they were going to do there because of the significance of this archaeology, of right. the archaeological mm -hmm. site. Yeah, that's an excellent yeah. point. And... And before the work started in 2006, you know, few people had any sense, few archaeologists or other people had any sense as to how much, if any, of the Crow Indian Agency buildings and other materials still remained. You know, I think the general sense was there's probably very little mm -hmm. still there, mm -hmm. but that turned out to be wrong. And I did not direct the archaeological investigations. You know, Steve Auberg uh, mm -hmm. did that. And yeah. All of us have known Steve for a, yeah. you know, a long yeah. time. He's a very, very capable yeah. archaeologist. So he directed the investigations and discovered that a lot of the agency was still preserved. In 2011, during the excavations, they actually found stone foundations of the main agency compound. It was not a fort. This wasn't a military fort, but it was a, an agency with buildings that were inhabited by the, the Indian agent and other people. Government and officials. Government yeah. officials, yeah. doctors, yeah. officers, yeah. blacksmiths, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And it turned out the foundations were still present, stone foundations, well-preserved, as well as you know, other areas of the site. So as Crystal said, when that, when they would you realized from the work that Steve directed that, wow, there's a lot still preserved here and lots of artifacts and animal bones. That, that, uh, you know, that was you know, a thrilling discovery for, for all of us archaeologists that, uh, that a lot of the site still remained. So I, I analyzed the animal bones from, from the excavations and found some interesting things. We were able, with in being able to identify the location of the agency compound, and then with a map that one of the Indian agents had created, a very, a, a very competent map yeah, showing a detailed map, a detailed yeah. map showing the location of the agency building, and also showing the location of what was called on the map Doby Town which is a series of dwellings, small cabins or houses, close to the agency compound that, at least for much of the time, was inhabited by the Crow peoples themselves. That map in, enabled us to sort of place the artifacts and animal bones we were finding uh, in relation to to with to these two different parts of the site. Yeah. And so the excavations revealed what seemed to be sort of a discard area, trash disposal area, 
close to the agency compound that we presume was associated with the trash, associated with the activities that were taking place primarily by the Indian the white agent, Indian yeah. agents and other people. And then another trash disposal area over by the oh. Dobie town that we presume represented the disposal by the, the Crow people living in Dobie town. And so I had that information that I could, so when I was analyzing the animal bones, I could compare the mm. bone assemblage from the Dobie town trash disposal area to the bone assemblage from the, um, from the agency compound area. And there are some similarities, but it's also some very interesting differences. There's a range of animal species present. From my analysis, the most common animal is domestic cow. Mm -hmm. um, there might also be bison bones represented. They can often be difficult, difficult to separate, yeah. especially sure. if the bones are fragmentary. But you know, for the most part, the bones that I was able, that were either bison or cattle, uh, that I was able to identify with confidence were bison. There are also deer, pronghorn antelope, canids of three different sizes, a fox-sized canid, a, um, sort of a coyote-sized canid, and then something a little bit larger than coyote, mm -hmm. all of which potentially could be domestic dogs that mm -hmm. were present. Mm -hmm. um, smaller carnivores, you know, uh, so, so the most abundant Species represented were the cattle by far, domestic mm -hmm. cows, mm -hmm. deer, and then pronghorn were the next most abundant, and the canid bones, and then smaller quantities of small carnivores and birds, some bone that I think are probably mm -hmm. chicken mm -hmm. and some other kind of bird I couldn't identify, some fish bones and so forth. Okay. And um, there were a lot of cow bones, both in the Dobie Town dump and in the, the disposal area and in the... Uh, disposal area associated with the agency compound. And those bones, they had been sawed with metal saws and chopped with metal you know, axes and hatchets and so forth and cut marks from metal knives and butchering and so forth. And, and this was very interesting for me because being able to document these saw marks and chop marks and so forth can help to reconstruct um, butchery patterns and butchery practices and so forth. Um, but there were some, so and that was present in both those the bones from both of those areas. There were some interesting differences, though. There were much more, a much larger proportion of the deer and pronghorn bones and canid bones came from the Dobie Town disposal area, mm -hmm. much less of that from the agency disposal era area. So that should suggest dietary differences. Yeah, with the, yeah. the, Maybe more hunting. Still um, hunting. The um, crow people are doing still doing hunting of the pronghorn and the deer. Correct, uh -huh. that sort of thing. Okay. And the, the dogs also, the canids, almost all of those bones came from the, the Dobie Town area and very, mm. almost nothing, very little from the agency compound yeah. and disposal area. What about the chicken bones? Were they? The chicken bones, boy, I'd, I'd have to go back to my records okay. and see exactly yeah. where those came from. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. But one of the other interesting differences was that in the Dobie Town area, area the, the bones associated with the, the disposal area of the Dobie Town, there was a lot of large quantity of small fragmentary bone reminiscent of the kinds of bones that we find in the processing areas at yeah. the First People's Buffalo Jump and the Bootlegger okay. Trail of Bison Kill, processing with bones to extract the grease, breaking the bones open to get marrow, and then further breaking the bones and boiling them to extract grease, both of which were important nutrients. Yeah. And the evidence suggests that that activity was might well have been taking place, breaking the bones open, leg bones open to get extract the marrow, and possibly also further breaking the bones and boiling them to extract the grease. That okay. is, Pretty so, solid evidence that that was going on okay. in the Dobie Town area. Okay. And nothing. So Crow people were doing that, but then you didn't see evidence of, of, the, of the white evidence folks of that doing that. Yeah. The, correct. Oh. So, so that yeah. could reflect the traditional dietary practices yeah. still being continued, being practiced among the, the right, Crow people. Right there on the cusp of when they were really trying to get things to change. Yeah. I mean, it's such a snapshot into it is. those few years. Of and, and that's such an important site because it is that time when...
Crow people went from a more of a hunting gathering subsistence to a more settled subsistence. And so you see that in the archaeological record, which is fascinating and right. interesting. Yeah. So so um, there's so much more to come out of that site. Uh, there's so much more information that will be coming out. Um, and, and you drive right over site. it yeah. when you're, when you you're know, heading. You and now there's that, a marker, yeah. though, right there. I mean, there has been. There's always but been a, a marker. There might be yeah. even a, a bigger one now. But it's when you're when you're driving between um, Absorki and Red Lodge, mm-hmm. is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, on that mm-hmm. road there. Yeah. Um, so that's something that um, I'm sure uh, certain parts of Montana people are very familiar with. Um, so, Jack, also... Um, in the past decade or more, you've been working with uh, John Parkington. He works at the Department of Archaeology at the University of Cape Town. And you've both been researching hunter-gatherer sites. And this particular site in um, South Africa, I believe it's along the coast. Is it a coastal Correct. site occupied by hunter-gatherers? And it's occupied by um, modern humans, right? I just wanted to be Correct. clear. Yeah, there are... And John and, and his colleagues have investigated, excavated a number of sites a right long along the Atlantic area. coast and okay. also to some to, to inland to, you know, from a few hundred meters to a few kilometers to 30 okay. or 50 kilometers inland. And, I, and these are all the sites that I've been involved with in analyzing with, with John Partington. These are fully modern people. Cognitively and anatomically. Right. So we're not so, talking yeah. about Homo erectus, and we're not right. talking about the Hobbit, and we're not talking about any of those things <laughs> here, or Homo naledi, or Australopithecus sediba, or all any of those things. We're talking about fully modern humans, but about how old are some of these sites? They the range, range in age. You know, there are two sites in particular that I've been involved with. One is Elands Bay Cave. So it's a cave located right at a location called a bay called Elands Bay on the Atlantic coast. Right. And the occupations go back from as recently as you know, 300, roughly 300 years ago or so, well after the colonial era sure. had gotten started, of right. European colonists coming in, going back you know, 13,000, 15,000 years, I think even you know, lesser degree occupation wow. 20,000 years ago or so. Wow. Most of the research I've been involved with at, with the Elands Bay Cave is with archaeological materials, especially animal bones, but also with artifacts and so forth, from about 13,000 years ago right up to you know, the recent 300, 400-year-old stuff. That's a huge span of time to have hunter-gatherers continuing to use a site. Yeah. And I know some of the research you're doing, just um, when I've gotten to pop in on either some lunch lectures or some other times that you've talked about these, um, is it the rock hyrex? What's the name of rock it? Hyrex. The, the cute little animal that <laughs> scurries around and I've seen them because they've been in South Africa and they're adorable, but you are talk about how they have a very restricted birth season. So kind of like we talked about with bison, that there's certain times of year that they give birth. And then these guys, you know, mature quite quickly. I, I think they're, they're Correct. a smaller yeah. mammal. So, um, because of that, you are able to then determine to some extent the seasonality in, in which hunter-gatherers were at a site if some of these rocks, high racks, remains have been used, hunted, Correct. whatever, and yeah. end up in specific deposits. So talk a right. little bit about that. So, so uh, we're interested in the season of site occupation at Elands Bay Cave and these other sites in that area just as we are here, back here in Montana, with the season of, of occupation, among other things. Um, John has proposed that for these, what's called later Stone Age, that's okay. the, that's the mm-hmm. term that the archaeologists give to this time period, starting roughly 40,000 years ago, on up to the sort of European hunter gatherers and European hunter, contact, yep. although pastoralists did move into this area roughly 1,000 years ago or so. But um, interested in if John had proposed that Perhaps there was seasonal mobility. This is groups moving, spending some of the time on the coast, like at Elands Bay Cave, right. and then at other times of year moving inland, maybe you know thirty or forty miles, and occupying sites in the interior, and then you know, going back and forth. Okay. And one way of testing whether this hypothesis is correct or not is to try and establish what season of the year. The different layers were occupied at Elands Bay Cave, 
and at some of these other sites like an open air site, the Dunefield Midden site, which we abbreviate as DFM, right. which I've also yes. done quite a bit of work work on. And that's a recent one. That's about 700 years old, that occupation. Um, you know, were the occupations, do they seem to be seasonally restricted or were they living at these sites year round all, all, or, all okay. year round or at least mm-hmm. during all seasons of the year? Um, so that's the, the purpose in trying to get at seasonality. And so just like in um, First People's Buffalo Jump, we're using tooth eruption in bison. Um, the rock hyrax, as you pointed out, Nancy, have seasonally restricted birthing as well, especially the further south. We're talking now south of the equator. The further south you get from the equator, the more seasonally restricted the birthing is. The closer you get to the equator, the less seasonal variation there is in climate and temperature and so forth. So there's right. birthing. But we're far enough south that there is seasonally restricted restricted birthing. So I'm using the tooth eruption from uh, in sequences in juvenile rock hyraxes yeah. to try and come up with a, a basis for estimating you know, what roughly at least what season of the year. So they, did you have to uh, first get a whole bunch of like modern rock hyrax? I did not, fortunately. Fortunately, they are, they, such a collection was available. You didn't have to go there, out and trap those cute no, little critters. No, <laughs> thank cute little critters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah. I, know. I mean, I know, I know people who get so into setting bones, Jack, they're picking up roadkill everywhere and stuff like that. So I get how it works. But, yeah. well, good. That's good. Fortunately, there was a collection at the university, at the right. archaeology department of nice. hyraxes. With, where that information was known, the month of death was known. Mm-hmm. So I used that to come up with criteria and then applied that to the archaeological, the archaeological assemblages. Sites. Nice. Mm. The, I mean, that Atlantic coast, I don't know how much you've tried mm. to swim in it, but the, the Indian Ocean side is much warmer when you're down in Cape Town. <laughs> right. And literally there's some yeah. spots where you can just drive like 20 minutes to the other side and you're swimming in the Indian right. Ocean and it's much warmer. <laughs> yeah. And then you can see at the very tip, you know, right. where the, where they meet, there's this cool current. But on that Atlantic side, I would be like, that has to be seasonal because you would not want to be out there all year round. <laughs> but no, fascinating. Um, uh, and, and how fun to be able to... Um, take these methods uh, that you've developed and to be able to use them at sites of different time periods and different places and, and mm-hmm. to be able to apply that and to work with people asking such different questions about humans. Um, I find hunter-gatherers a lot more fascinating than I think I did when I first started in archaeology. Mm-hmm. I think I was all about the like emergence of civilizations and when things got complex and, and pretty, you know, like mm-hmm. lots of cool architecture. <laughs> and now I'm all about hunter gatherers. <laughs> trying to yeah. figure out like. Well, they the, really knew what was going on. Well, <laughs> and, and literally that's what yeah. we were for yeah. most of our time yeah. as humans and to figure out how we adapted to so many different places and, and created these societies. And, and like you said, these, these patterns of even just how we lay out sites. I mean, humans are such patterned, mm-hmm. uh, you know, mm-hmm. behavioral. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess other animals are, but we are complex in the way we do it and the reasons why we do it the way we do, you know. So mm-hmm. it's it's fascinating to, to look at those societies. It's yeah. been a two-way street for me. I've been able to take some of what I've learned here in the Great Plains, the bison tooth eruption, and I didn't develop the right. the. Yeah tooth eruption schedules for bison. and other archaeologists did that and then I made use of that but I yeah. took that information that method and then applied it to the rock higher axes but on the other hand I've learned a great deal from archaeologists in South Africa that I've that mm. been able to bring back and that has informed the archaeology I do here in Montana so it's been right. for me very you know very enriching well, and very very fulfilling to to carry out yeah. research among and you, you've been people. able to do to completely mm-hmm. different kinds of projects in Africa, on the African continent. And you've also spent some time in Russia. Is that true? I had a brief visit okay. in Russia. I didn't oh. do any research there, okay. but I saw some interesting archaeological sites. Okay. But, mm-hmm. I just think the more we travel as anthropologists yeah, and historians, right. the, it just yeah. can't help but inform the and way you... collaborate with other people yeah. in different places. Think it of just, questions, yeah. ask questions, research right. questions. It's wonderful. Just, yeah. Yeah. The South African research reinforces a point that we talked about previously with respect to First People's Buffalo Jump and all of those artifacts and animal bones now being curated and available right. for future researchers. Yeah. I have not dug a single trowel of dirt in, in South Africa. Mm. All of the analyses I've done are from 
materials, animal bones, and artifacts that were excavated by John and other archaeologists years ago and that are curated either at the University of Cape Town or at a museum in downtown Cape Town. And so it's a great example of yeah, how right. revisiting decades after these sites were excavated, going back and look with new questions, yes. new techniques, analytical techniques, and so forth. Um, this is just a case study of the value of, right, you know, right. of uh, what are And then rewarding. that becomes yeah. this wonderful technique that now that you publish on it and have sorted it, that other people can use at other sites in mm-hmm. South Africa, where there are rock hyrax, you mm-hmm. know, so that's a, as a way to determine seasonality, at least in part. Yeah. Um, I yeah. don't think we we probably if if we never dug another site again or right. excavated another site again, we'd have research for eons right. because there's right. so much so right. many archaeological sites that have been excavated and and we can just continue to research those artifacts Correct. instead of digging yeah. digging more and more and more. So you know, I think that's what. Um, when we work with students, we always encourage them to go to the local museum and see what collections are there and do research on those collections instead of, you know, going out and digging up more yeah. Yeah, <laughs> artifacts right. that you have to, right. you have to take yeah. care of forever. So, yeah. <laughs> so Jack, we want to, um, we're, we're getting to the end of our time. So we just want to ask you about one more site. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're just touching, we're just kind of touching the surface of all the work that you've done over the years. But um, one of the sites that you mentioned before was Lost Terrace. And so can you just tell us a little bit about that site and what you learned from but that? You have, to that mention, you have to mention that it's it's because you, you know, we have Shane oh, Hope yes, here yes, in Hope yeah, Archaeology. Yeah. And a lot of the students you and I have had, Jack, have have then gone on to work for Shane. And when you told them that Mm -hmm. we were interviewing Jack Fisher, they're like, all excited. Um, But they wanted, they wanted specifically uh, for us to ask you about um, the Lost Lost Terrace Terrace. site. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we, so we um, have Hope Archaeology in our building and Shane Hope employs a lot of the students and um, that come out of Montana State University, which is wonderful. So Tristan and Emily, I'll say their names, Tristan. (laughs) and Emily when I when they heard I was interviewed we were going to interview you they said well ask Jack Jack this and this and this and this and this and so so we'll finish with one of their requests which is Lost Terrace. So the Lost Terrace site is is very interesting to me for two reasons and one is that it was occupied roughly 1,200 years ago it's located in the Missouri River right along the Missouri River in the, in the valley bottom of the Missouri River in north-central Montana. And we discovered during the excavations that it represents procurement and utilization of a large number of pronghorn antelope. Um, and is that the, somewhat unusual to have a large, is it like a kill site? It, it is like unusual. It, it looks site? sort of like a communal bison kill site, but it's a communal pronghorn but, antelope kill site. Antelope. Yes. And so, yeah, that, so yeah, that's yeah, very unusual. There are a few communal prong, pronghorn yeah. sites known scattered across the northern plains, but they're more the exception than the, than the rule. Mm-hmm. So that got our attention. They're not you know. herding animals in the same way that bison or they, elk are? They are to some extent. In the winter of the year, pronghorn tend Gather, to form yeah, large yeah. groups. Yeah, all okay. Both sexes and all ages come together in large groups. In the spring, they start breaking up into smaller groups, and then I always the see just like yeah, them all scattered all over scattered, when I'm so driving through the you know, exactly along the so, Madison. So okay, so that's a lot of times you see them scattered, but in the winter time, they're gathered together, and that actually might help to explain mm. this. So, in my analysis of the animal bone assemblage, and as I mentioned earlier, that's mm-hmm. where the Lost Terrace bone assemblage is where I got my start uh, yeah, yeah. analyzing them. I determined that there was a minimum, at least 80, roughly 80 pronghorn antelope. Wow. And we think quite a bit of the site was washed away yeah, probably decades or centuries after the okay. site was formed just by the Missouri River erosion. Sure. So there might have been you know, roughly twice that many. So that is... A pronghorn represented. So when you're saying 80, that's like a a minimum Mm -hmm. number of individuals. So there's a lot of of bones in every animal, but the way you do it is by looking at those minimum numbers of sort of one specific part. Okay, great. Exactly. Great. 80, that's a lot. So a lot of them. So so that's one question is why, what's going on with, you know, the 
why this communal procurement and very thorough utilization mm. of these carcasses. There's lots of cut marks. Every, almost every limb bone had been broken open to extract the marrow. There are hammerstone percussion marks wow. from hitting the limb bones with a, a round cobble, river really cobble probably to break people. them open, cut marks all over. Yeah. The bones were smashed, and I'm sure they were boiling the bones in water to extract the grease, so very thorough utilization. And part of the reason that uh, Tristan and Emily um, asked about the lost terracite is because it's such a good, the, the bone is so well preserved and it's such a good example of mm. stone tool cut marks, hammerstone uh, percussion yeah. marks that I use that in my class yeah. in zooarchaeology. So people get used Tr to seeing so what it looks like, they have a comparative collection of yeah. cut marks, that's yeah, Tristan actually did an analysis of some of the bones looking at the cut marks and so right. forth I mean, right. in the zooarchaeology class. Right. And we were able to establish seasonality using two methods that we've talked about previously. One is the tooth eruption in mm -hmm. juvenile, juvenile animals, and research done by wildlife biologists who've been studying pronghorn. They established the tooth eruption criteria that I then applied and said, wow, this looks like winter of the year. Mm -hmm. And then we also found large quantities of fetal bones of okay. pronghorn antelope. Yeah. And another zooarchaeologist analyzed those and determined it was winter of the year from that. So we've got pretty solid evidence. And so we're thinking, you know, one interpretation is that this might have been a particularly severe winter because pronghorn normally live in what we call the uplands, the prairie uplands. They typically don't spend much time down in the river valley bottoms. Mm -hmm. But research by wildlife biologists studying pronghorns showed that in very particularly severe winter conditions, sometimes they will go down into river bottoms. Mm -hmm. So we know we're pretty right. confident that it's winter of the year. Um, so large this number a of pronghorn time, land alone. Was this a one time? No, well, that's a good kill? question, too. Okay. It looks like probably two or three different kill events, okay. and that's based especially on the fetal bones because there, there seem to be two or three. You get one mm -hmm. cluster of limb bones that are one length, and then another cluster that are a little bit longer, and another cluster a bit longer. Okay. So maybe a two month span. Okay. Roughly, roughly, just as an okay. estimate, but not sort of you know ten years apart, or that you're not. That, that's yeah. yeah that's, that's the second thing that fascinates me about that site. It's conceivable that they might be a year apart or okay. ten years, but I think it's unlikely mm -hmm. because why? You know, it seems unlikely that people would return to the, exactly the same location mm -hmm. and kill pronghorn. And this is the same location at the very same time of year, just mm -hmm. maybe a. Mm -hmm. A few weeks apart, it mm -hmm. seems much more reasonable, much more likely to me that we're dealing with a single uh, short occupation event of just a few weeks. People were there and hunting pronghorn antelope maybe every two or three weeks or something like that. Wow. And maybe bison had moved away, so maybe the people themselves were facing some food shortages and they transferred their bison hunting Skills, skills to communal hunting of right. pronghorn. So you don't have 18 feet of depth like you no, have no, it's at very, very, uh, first people. Very, it's just one. It's a, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so that's the second yeah. thing that fascinates me. It's almost like we just have this little snapshot yeah. in time, yeah. just a moment in time represented at the Lost Terrace. So one of these very rare archaeological sites where you almost you get the feeling that, wow, you know, it's, everything we're looking at here happened almost Right. instantaneously yeah. and you wow. don't, we don't get that too often so right. Right. So right. So it makes it a little more a little simpler um, but more complex because you have to figure out is that correct correct yeah. Yeah. was there was there any suggestion of a processing area near by sort of like there was with um, a lot of the other bison yeah that's a sense. good question I think that my sense is that mostly what we were excavating was kind of a disposal area a trash okay. dump uh, and maybe a processing area might have been incorporated in that, and maybe the people were disposing of stuff right nearby. I okay. strongly suspect that there was a habitation site Near. very close by. Okay. It would have been great to apply some of the FA yeah. insights to try and find that. I, from I, it looks much more like to me like we had a trash disposal area and possibly partially a processing okay. area. And you'd said some of the terrace was washed away, so also who knows Correct. what yeah. part of the site. Okay, right. interesting. And it was buried deep in deep sediments. There was something like 18 or 20 feet of overlying sediments just to get down to that. So Oh, did it show up in a cut bank? Is yeah, it showed up in a cut bank. Wow. It was discovered showing up in a cut bank. So And then everyone's probably so, expecting to find bison bone, and they're just pulling out. And, a little bit. and I just have to say this 
this one thing because it's often puzzled me, and I think I've said it to you before, is I'm always surprised that there's just not more elk that mm-hmm. shows yeah. up yeah. in the archaeological record in Montana. In... I'm surprised, too. That's a great, yeah. great question. You know, where are the elk? Where are the <laughs> yeah. elk? Are yeah. they just super smart and sneaky and they're harder to get? People don't mm-hmm. want to waste time on them? Or do people not like how they taste? Or I just feel like that's a, a really interesting question for the future mm-hmm. for somebody to right. figure out. But, yeah, yeah. they're not. They're certainly not as... As prominent in in the remains, so so Jack, thanks so much. I feel like we picked your brain for a lot of really interesting <laughs> questions, and now I probably just have a hundred more. <laughs> I know. Thanks so much, Jack. That was a great conversation. It was so much fun. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. It was fun talking with the two of you. Yeah, we we will be getting you back here, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So thanks to you and thanks to all our listeners out there for joining us today. If you love this podcast, please tell a friend and make sure to subscribe so it shows up in your podcast feed each week and consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, but only if it's positive. Right. Thanks for listening today and we hope that you can join us again to find out more about the, the dirt, dirt on, on the, the past. past. We'd love to also give a big shout out to our sponsor today, the Western Heritage Center, located in Billings, Montana. They are a museum with the mission to collect, preserve, and tell the stories of the people and places of the Yellowstone River Valley and the Northern High Plains region. They do this in so many different ways through their exhibits in the museum, but they also have a very active outreach program. So if you're in the Billings area, make sure to stop by and see them. They have some amazing exhibits right now. Now, one of them is on um, called it. One of them is called "Conquering Diseases of the Past," which I'm going to head over to Billings and check out soon. So, thanks so much to the director of the Western Heritage Center. Kevin Quaestra, and thanks to the Western Heritage Center for sponsoring this podcast. And a big thank you to our editor and sound guru, Steve Durbin. Thanks also to Lawson Alegria for our music and to John Chadwell for help getting this podcast out into the world. 